Hi, welcome to the interviews with the Haunting Masters, brought to you by Phoenix Shooting Bags. And, uh, you know, happy Coos Day Tuesday to everybody. Today we're, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, shooting at extreme angles with bow. Um, some of the things to consider, body form, tuning things, um, and just kind of look at it from a, a big picture and, and look at all the things that, that go into shooting at, uh, you know, extreme angles. I, um, I did quite a bit of this research and poked around a lot about it when, when I was getting ready for my Ibex hunt. And, uh, the guy who helped me out with it was Tim Gillingham. So I have him on today and we are going to discuss, uh, this and hopefully paint the picture for you guys to, uh, be able to, uh, you know, implement that in your own shooting. How's it going, Tim? Oh, not too bad, John. How are you? No, I can't complain. Um, it's, uh, it's getting pretty freaking hot over here. So well, you do live in Arizona. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's been pretty good. Like I, I'm okay. I could deal with hundred degree weather when it's still cool in the morning and, and then it cools down at night. But you know, once it starts like where it's like a hundred degrees at 10 o'clock at night and you know, four o'clock in the morning, it's still a hundred degrees and I can't deal <laughs> it anymore. But we're, yeah, we're starting to get to that point where it's getting hot, really hot now. So, yeah, I'm glad I visit lots of places across the country. That way I make, don't make any rash decisions on where I, I really like Utah, man. We have four seasons and it's like you said, it's cool in the morning and it may get up to 90, but it's, it's, yeah. uh, you can deal with it. Yeah, for sure. No, I, I like Utah. I, um, I, I definitely enjoy four seasons. I mean, I, I came from New York, so I had four seasons and, uh, it was definitely a, a change. Now we have, I have summer and I have fall and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you guys get some rain pretty quick. Cause I got an Arizona elk tag this year. So. Oh, that's right. That's right. You told me you got a what, six, a tag, right? Yeah. That's awesome. That'll be a fun hunt. I'm sure it'll be better than. Just about anything it might suck for you guys because you guys are spoiled, but uh, you know, eventually I'll draw a Utah tag sometime yeah. in the next millennium. I got, I got lucky. I got the Utah tag last year. I had a Manti. Manti, did you get a good one or? Yeah, I shot like three forty something. Well, that's a nice bull. That's a good Manti bull. Yeah, yeah. I honestly, I was chasing a much bigger bull, and um, he was definitely over three sixty maybe 370 big big bull um and i thought he was dead because he left all the cows they just he just disappeared and then it's funny thing was we just got back to the truck packing my bull out and one of my friends that came up from arizona helped me pack him out He's like, hey, I'm going to sit down and glass. He starts glassing. He looks across. He's going, bro, I got this giant bull. And it had, ends up being him. And he's sitting alone by himself across the canyon, just laying there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you got to be shitting me. Yeah. Well, welcome to our crappy seasons we have here in Utah where they cater to rifle hunters in the rut. Yeah. Well, I that's what it is. I had the, I had the rifle tag. I oh, had yeah, the, the rifle Yeah, man. I, 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 didn't even, I didn't even know I put in for the rifle tag. I thought I put in for the archery tag uh, and accidentally. So I put in for the rifle tag. I hunted with my bow the whole, the whole hunt. And then I had two situations in a row, two evenings in a row where I ran out of time yeah. and I couldn't get close enough with the bow. And I'm like, shit, if I had the rifle, this thing would be done. So that, that when I was presented with the same scenario, of course, I snuck in and I shoot this thing at like 66 yards with my rifle. I totally could have killed it with the bow. <laughs> Never take a rifle on a bow hunt. Tell yeah, me. you know, and I wasn't going to, but I was like, you know what? It took me how many years to draw this tag? I'm like, I don't want to eat it. I don't want to eat it, but I don't oh, know. Yeah, and I mean, then what? I think about it and I'm like, I, I've killed how many different animals with a bow and, and, you know, never had that backup. And I, I don't know. Oh, well. Yeah. But we probably better get, get going on this subject. We could read Yeah, absolutely. All of it. So let's talk about it, uh, shooting at extreme angles. What are some of the things to consider? And 
Well, you know, extreme angles is, is definitely a real world situation in hunting. And I think what a lot of guys do is they get these shots, you know, they get up, they click it with their rangefinder, they miss or make a poor shot, and they never really know why. And I, and I always said that 3D archers, for example, never learn why they made a mistake because there's too many variables. They didn't know how far it is. Um, they only get one shot. But field archers, you know, once you've missed four times, you pretty much got an idea something's wrong. And where I've learned most of my skills um, for shooting slopes and for shooting angles and for making mistakes on sight leveling, and like you talked about, there's even form issues when you get, you know, out of, you know, normal position that really play into bad left and rights. And I've learned everything the hard way by making mistakes. And, you know, but I've learned a lot training for these European pro fields because the Europeans are really – they really get off on making some steep and deep courses and it's it's so much fun and it's a lot like hunting rocky mountain mule deer you know when you're shooting a 30 degree vertical slope i mean i shot one of my deer on kodiak last year at pretty extreme shot i mean okay. i won't even tell you how far the rangefinder was saying but it was a 30 degree slope and pretty long distance but it was that knowledge gained and, and part of the knowledge i'm gaining getting ready for um these tournaments, but at the flip side of it, I'm also um, logging information for my hunting setups. And one thing I've learned is that the cutting portion of this is very specific to speed, and the rangefinders don't do a very good job. Okay, so they're fine for the average whitetail hunter; they get you close enough. But as you get over 20 degrees and over 50 yards, they become viciously off. In fact, I, I I had mentioned to Levi Morgan that before he went on his stone sheep hunt a couple of years ago. And, and I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, I just wanted to, you know, impart some of the stuff that I learned to him so he didn't make a big mistake on a very expensive hunt, you know. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I just showed him a couple examples how far the rangefinder cutting was actually off. And um, I learned this because everybody, you know, in archery, we talk about this and we talk about that. But most of the courses here in the U.S. are not tough enough where – you normally, I'd always used an archer's advantage cut shot chart, and yeah. it always seemed to be spot on for me. Well, courses like Reading, you know, most of the field courses like Darrington, they're not really aggressive, okay? Um, and, and that was adequate. So before I went to my first pro series over in, in Europe, I said, okay, I'm going to go test this out. I'm going to find the steepest hill I can find, right? And I found a 40-degree slope at 75 yards, and I put a target at the top and a target at the bottom. Well, I lost about eight arrows before I even hit the target, <laughs> you know, because my rangefinder was four yards off on the downhill. It was hitting high, and it was four yards low on the uphill, hitting low. And then it was just like, oh, no, man, I got a colossal amount of work ahead of me to, to try to get accurate information. But I did. I walked up and down those hills, and it worked. It, and, you know, I spent this weekend getting my bow ready for this OPA tournament that's going to be held at so Seven Springs. If somebody wants a good experience on this and learn how to hit minute targets at, you know, some decent angles. Even, even say, even say a, a 15 degree slope at 60 yards is a tough shot. I mean, it might not be hard to hit this hunting, but to no. go ahead and hit a 12 ring that's, you know, that big, it, it, be, it takes very precise information and, you know, once I get my bows all dialed in, then I'll take them out and I'm going to shoot these slopes in with targets. It's the only way I know how to do it. I'm sure there's a smart engineer out there that I could work with and he could figure it out and get it perfect. Right. But the problem is, is that I see is it all based on ballistics. Okay. It's just like a rifle. You have to have a way to compute the actual uh, trajectory line of the arrow. And, uh, and speed changes that big time. And, and I think right. some of it is how much distance you're actually cutting because if what i'm seeing is the faster i shoot mm -hmm. the more i have to cut sometimes but i think it's basically your cut say you're cutting two inches and at 280 that two inches is a yard and a half it may be it may be three yards at 320 you know so there's a lot of information i probably know it as good as anybody but then again i think i'm really only in in my infancy as far as knowledge of of how to shoot the slopes and i'm when I hunt, I actually have a cut chart that I've developed off 
awful what the rangefinder says, and it's a quick percentage. Because in a hunting situation, I need to make decisions quickly. I, right. I remember one time I had a big deer, like 195, 200 inch mule deer on the Wasatch here. I had him at, within a doable shot for me. But when I looked down on my cut chart, I just it was just too many numbers. It fell between the between the uh, the five degree right. increments and five and ten yard increments, and so it was just like I knew in my mind how much a yard at that distance was, and I knew I had to be within a yard. And I just my brain just fritzed, man. I just I couldn't process all that information and calculate it. So I've come up with a, a cut chart for myself. And, and I don't even think it's 100% accurate because it's more based off of the 295 foot per second that I compete with in these field tournaments. Right. But it's a hell of a lot closer than trusting the rangefinder. Okay. It may be a half yard or a yard off based on the speed. I don't know until I get out and actually shoot it in. Right. But it's I think a lot our, better. You use the same rangefinder as me, right? You use the TBR, the Leupold? The Leupold, from what I've seen, is the best actual rangefinder on the market it cuts the slope it, it, it ranges targets the most accurate of anything on the market yeah um i agree some of the guys are using like a tape measures they're right. super accurate but they're not real practical in a hunting situation um i've tried other range finding binoculars but you know some of them don't give you they don't cut close enough you need 10th yard cut I mean, you, you, right. you need 10th yard increment cuts in archery um and a lot of these when they get out further they you know it's plus or minus a yard or even Leicas and stuff are plus or minus a yard, and that's not good enough. And know? the reason why I brought that up is because I think the loophole, the the speed that it's set at when you're on the highest speed is 275 feet per second. They don't have any way of setting the speed that I know of. No, so yeah, if you go in, it, there's there you pick uh, A, B, or C. That's for and, rifles. Uh, and, okay, on the oh, let's see, on the rifles. Oh, on the bow. Yeah, the bow. I'm sorry, the bow. You don't set it. It's it's, but it's. I think it's set. I think they told me it was like at 275 or 280 feet per second. It was like an average of what hunting bows just yeah, are at this time. Not, so, so if you're that set. much further ahead at 305 feet per second or whatever, I yeah, can see. I, you, I think I can see you every out. conversation I've ever had with any rangefinder manufacturer, they set it 100 percent based off cosine. Cosine is okay, frankly so. Enough. It's, so it's not no accurate. speed it's in straight it, line right? distance. Okay, got it. They they may or may not, I I don't know I, I don't know that information. All I know is it's not right. So got it. Got um, it. Most most of the, most archers in 3D archery have, have adopted the the low pole range fighter as the very best far as ranging the different color targets with with the least amount of error and stuff in them. But uh, but still nobody's cut slope correctly. I mean, 100% correctly. And, and in order to do that, you'd have to be able to input speed and ballistic data to be able to do so. So there's nothing that beats just simple old hard work. Um, you know, you just need to get out and, you know, go shoot a slope that's approximately 20 degrees and shoot it at 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100 if, if that's your distance. And, and just figure out in a percentage how far your rangefinder's off. And then I just make a little quick chart that, you know, I look down and I say, you know, it's 80 at 20, it says 3%. So I cut 3% on, and I got an uphill side and a downhill side. And, and so I can make a quick, so eight times three is 2.4. So I cut 2.4 off what the rangefinder says. So it gives me a quick adjustment to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's just the technical side. That's, in my opinion, that is the hardest thing in hunting is knowing where to set your sight. Like on your Ibex hunt, that's gonna be absolutely the hardest thing to do because number one, we don't do it very often. Right. And number two, most guys just go up there and they, they trust their rangefinder until they've gone up. I, I remember I talked to Phil, Phil Mendoza had a sheep tag a couple years ago, and I, I sent him my little cut chart. That, and it was kind of rudimentary at the time, but I think if he'd have used it, he'd have had better luck to start with. But he missed like several sheep, and, I, and he posted something on Facebook. So I, I sent him the card again, and he went back out and used it and actually actually killed one. But, you know, back on, on Levi's story, he did the same thing. That, that 40 degree slope that I had set up at 75, well, he ended up shooting his doll, like, or his, it's a spanner or whatever he shot, but he shot it at like, I think he said, somewhere around 68 yards at a 38 degree slope or something like that. And he cut like five yards off his rangefinder. Now you could never do that unless you'd actually went out and set those scenarios up and, and learn to trust them. Yeah. You know, can you imagine walking up and ranging something with a laser range?
supposedly cut and slope and then cutting an additional five yards. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that takes some legwork to actually figure that out. If you're going to do those extreme hunts like that sheep, mountain goats, you know, like you said, the Ibex hunt, um, that can be some, I've heard guys tell, you know, talking about, and maybe it was you I was talking to, shooting 80 yeah. yards basically straight down at 55, 60 degrees. Oh, yeah. You know, I shot my doll sheep at 46 yards at a 55 degree slope. That's virtually straight down. I mean, it doesn't seem like straight down if you look at it mathematically, right. but when you're shooting, that feels like it's straight down. And it's about as steep as you could ever shoot. Yeah, my, 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 that, shot, that shot was 96 yards uh, line of sight, and the holdover was 32 on the range. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> Honestly, you probably should have, if the range fighter was saying 32, you probably, probably need to cut a little bit off of that. No, I actually, well, I hit low, and I hit low because of the wind. So I didn't take yeah. it. The wind was right in my face, and if you think about it, the, the mm -hmm. angle that it is, basically the wind is pushing it, the whole yep. arrow downwards the whole time. So I, I literally, yeah, I, like. Frank, Frank Pearson used to live outside Tucson there. He still does, but he lives in a different place. But he lived up on this hill. And I go up to his place a couple of times, and he had, a, he had updrafts in the evening and downdrafts in the morning. Uh -huh. And it would it would mess with your sight marks. I mean, yeah. but yeah, that's 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 real technical archery, and that's where you know when you're when you're building. You know, there's this big. I don't know if it's big or not, but I, I see it on Facebook and stuff. These guys, these high momentum bow hunter guys, and mm -hmm. they're all Ashby guys. They're talking about you know reliably building arrows to blow through major bones, and I don't think number one, I don't think it's reliable, and right. number two, I think. The number one reason we still miss as bow hunters is because we don't know the distance, okay? Mm -hmm. And compressing this stuff and making it faster and building, building using smaller diameter arrows that are less affected by the wind and, and using mechanical broadheads that are less affected by the wind and using smaller veins because I'm able to use a mechanical broadhead, all these things play into making longer, uh, more ethical shots. But, you know, let's put it in perspective too, John. Um, yeah. Bow hunting at 100 yards, and, and I, you know, I'm an expert at 100 yards with a, with a bow. Mm -hmm. It's still an extremely difficult shot that has to be, oh yeah, you know, really well thought out before you you try to achieve it because it it it's not that easy. It's not the same as where rifles have come. Where rifles go from 300 to 800 yards, and pretty much the average guy can pick up and shoot 800 yards. Oh, they yeah. can buy them. <laughs> I mean, it's not the same. No. Okay. You know, the biggest, the single biggest uh, invention for bow hunting has been rangefinders. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's crazy. You know, and I argue with, yeah, I argue with some of the guys about, you know, unmarked or marked 3D, and I prefer marked. Um, but what'd you do before rangefinders? I said, well, we, we missed. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, simply, we simply missed. You know, or you just, you really had to, you know, it doesn't mean that deer didn't get killed at 70 and 80 yards. Because guys just put them in the air because that happens all the time, irregardless of skill level. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> Send it. <laughs> even even with ring curves with no sights, you know. Yeah, oh. Fred Bear used to do it. Yeah, Fred Bear yeah. said you can't kill him if you don't shoot, right? Yeah, I mean exactly. he shot his world record stone sheep at like seventy yards. So. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's, you know, those are some of the scenarios and and why performance setups are are probably better than. Then, uh, you know, if you shoot fixed blades, you got to slow everything down to keep it accurate. You got to, you know, it's my misses are three times further in the wind. You know, you just got to, you got to pick the weapon for the, you know, for what you're doing. If you're shooting hogs over a feeder, it probably isn't going to matter. Okay. Yeah. But when we're talking slopes, um, there's there's several things, and and one of the things that I've I learned the hard way over and over again because. Back in the late 90s, the only information out there was was given by a couple of pro archers. And, you know, when I shot my uh, my doll sheep, guys were telling me, oh, you're going to get shots, but they're going to be very steep, and you're probably going to – you're not going to know what to set your sight for. So I had bought Kirk Etheridge's book at the time that was out. Kirk was kind of the man at the time indoors and even outside. But he had a little cosine cut chart in his book. And so I just cut I, – I, I copied it laminate it, stuck it in my pack. Well, that's what I used when I shot my doll sheep. I had no idea. Could right. you seriously cut 
off of a off of a cut. I mean, I shot it for 23 yards. And wow. and I looking back on that, I think I hit high from where I was aiming, so I probably could have shot it for 20 yards. Yeah. You know, but I hit him at such an angle it went in underneath his backbone and right out perfectly. But uh, you know, and a lot of times that kind of scenario happens in hunting too. Guys hit him bad, but you know they killed it, so they don't really go back and analyze. Right. That's my, hey, I missed that my case. <laughs> yeah. So you learn this stuff in target archery because there's a penalty for not hitting center. Um, where in hunting, if you hit the proverbial eight inch circle, you're good, right? Right. You don't go back and overanalyze why it got there. Exactly. Because most of the time we're we're somewhat jangled when we make that shot, and <laughs> you know, there's a lot of variables, you know. So yeah, that's an understatement. Um, <laughs> But sight leveling is something that people really have to get right. And um, the information that I was given early on was was somewhat correct, but it was but it was incorrect because, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think it's because the target archers at the time and the target bows at the time were not seeing a lot of shift from what I call static to full draw. So the bow in a static position being leveled versus at full draw. There wasn't that much change because we were dealing with 40 to 44 inch bows and eight, eight and a half inch brace heights. Okay. So these bows, the cable side didn't move very far. And, but when you're dealing with much shorter axle by axle bows, high let off, bows that are easily manipulatable, you know, by the shooter at full draw that can, you know, you can torque really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a reason why target archers, like for example, my target bows are all have 22 pounds of holding weight. Okay, that's a lot. The valley yeah. is the valley is very short. That's because, you know, we like that transition of, of the load to the arrow instantaneously. We don't want a big delay in there. Mm. You know, some of the companies talk about dwell time being a a good thing. I think it's a bad thing. It's kind of like shooting no. a puzzle. Yeah, because you got a you got a chance to uh, in, in, influence the bow before the arrow leaves the. Exactly. You have to follow through a lot better in that scenario. It's just like shooting a pellet rifle or a or a muzzleloader versus a high powered rifle. Right. When you shoot a twenty two two fifty that's shooting, you know, thirty six hundred foot a second, or you know, you can, you know, that bullet hits right where the, you know, the scope was. Whereas you know, you shoot a little, you know, spring piston air rifle, you had better learn to follow through. Or you won't hit anything with it. Right. Okay. So. There's there's reasons why we do things, but most guys in the hunt scenario, they're using short bows. You know, they got these triaxes now. You got uh, the average hunting bow, 32, 33 inches long, maybe. Right. And that just lends itself to a lot more problems in the leveling department. And so I was I was shooting Matthews Apexes back in the day, and you know, for hunt for target, and I wasn't seeing a lot of of change. And I thought I had this thing whipped, and I I built this little tool here. It's called a Hamsky third axis level. It's the first patent ever got in archery, you know, with the guys over at Hamsky, Andrew and, and Sean. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was this was my solution to the problem. Okay. But I had I wasn't using the pin. I actually had sold 30 of these things before I brought it in the office one day and I gave it to sales manager and I gave one to everybody here and and he'd come up to me, he's like, that ain't gonna work. I said, what do you mean it ain't going to work? Works just fine. He said, no, that bubble in that level is susceptible to the same amount of torque as the one in your sight. And I thought about it for a second. I was like, damn, he's right. And then instantly my mind went back to a shot that, you know, we had these, uh, oh, these big tournaments at Ski Resort up here. They, they used to call them Bowcast. Right, right. Now, the Bowcast at the bird. And I remember one shot up there. It was like a 106-yard doll sheep. And I I was shooting a Matthew switchback at the time, and I kept hitting him in the neck. You know, I'm hitting like, you know, 16 inches to the left, and I'm like, how? What, what am I doing wrong? There's not enough wind here. And I just did it over and over again, and it just that kind of stuff just sticks in my head. And and when I went back, and it took me about three days to come up with the pin version. And and what I come up with this off of was something similar to what Spot Hog does here. Okay. Right. The spot hog use a, a wire for their first axis. So they line all the pins up here with this, this wire and they use the wire to level the sights. Okay. Cause, cause that's what the level bubbles is actually doing. We'll go through that here in a second. But, um, so we come up with this, this pins, this pin system to level the sights. And when I went back and checked my hunting bow, 
becomes a half a bubble off. Well, that just solves it right there. A half a bubble at 106 yards, it's going to be about 18 inches off, you know. And so that's the importance of having your stuff perfect. Um, when you get into extreme angles, I went to a tournament in Belgium. It was one of the pro series, and they get crazy over there. I mean, we were shooting in this old World War II bunker, mm -hmm. and you're down inside of one of the, the bunkers, and you're shooting straight up. And it's an 11-yard shot at a 55 degree slope uphill. It was super hard. And I kept hitting to the left, okay? It was dry, it drove me nuts. I missed all four shots or all three shots. And I was like, and so I had to go home. I had to go to the drawing board and figure out what I was doing wrong. And simply all that was happening was when you get out of stream, extreme position, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're in a sense collapsed a little bit like this, right. okay? You have to learn to extend, and that's why everybody tells you to start here, set your okay. form, and then bend at the hips. That's so that you don't short draw, okay? That's the single biggest problem to shoot in extreme angles. Um, so I went home, and I created a – I was shooting a, a PSE Dominator at the time, and they had holes on the left side of the bridge to put another sight on. So I built this sight. You ever seen the old bow fishing sights that had two wires? Yes. Yes. I really don't know what the two wires were for, to be honest with you, for bow fishing, but I got the idea that, you know, if I could set these over and make them parallel to my first axis on the site and put the pin right between them, it would act kind of like a rear peep sight, a third okay. peep sight, and, and it worked like a charm. But you had to do it peripherally so it wasn't too much information, so you got jumpy on yeah, it. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you could tell, once you got into those stream positions now, the pin would be sitting over on the wire, you just pull a little harder, it pull it over to the middle. A little bit clunky for most setups, and a little bit too much weight on the bow, but it was a solution to a problem. Yeah. But that just taught me, you know, hey, when you're in extreme positions, you really got to make sure that you're getting back in alignment, okay, and getting everything in alignment. Because if you're out of alignment, the string just simply hits the arrow off center. You know, if you want to translate it to what happens, if you shot it through paper, it'd be shooting a left or a right tear based on the torque. And then right. the broadhead's going to steer opposite of the paper tear. Okay? Yep. So that's where you get your, your negative reaction. So all this stuff has, uh, you know, come to fruition. And I really, truly understand sight leveling better than, you know, most. Right. Um, the Hamsky tool has kind of been the, the mainstay, you know, for uh, sight leveling. Yeah. That being said... You can't use it on all sites. So when you when you go watch the the videos on on Hamsky site leveling that we've done, you know they're they're available all over the internet and on Hamsky website. You, what we try to do is teach you how to fish rather than teach you than do it for you. Right. right. Because you have to understand what you're doing in order to look at, you know, you want to look at this site that's a single pin slider, or you want to look at this site that's a spot hogger. You know, you want to come back over, and this is another version, you know, of another site. There, there's lots of different sites on the market, and they don't all have the same features. You know, one of the problems wow. is these, these site manufacturers, if you look here, they don't leave any place to mount a hamski. Mm -hmm. And it's one of my pet peeves. I mean, it drives me crazy. Okay? So you have to learn the concepts of site leveling in under, to understand what you're doing so that you can look at that site and say, how am I going to do this without that tool? Or, you know, how am I going to do this, you know, so on and so forth. So with that being said, let's go into the basics of site leveling, okay? Perfect. So the basics of site leveling are, are very simple, really. What we're trying to do is we're trying to set an indicator, okay? The level bubble is our indicator, correctly? Mm -hmm. The level bubble's job is to tell us the position of the first axis. Now, for those of you that don't understand first, second, and third axis, the first axis on this particular one pin mover is the, the vertical unit that the site slides up and down on, okay? On a pin site, it would be the rack of pins. Mm -hmm. On a site like this spot hog here, it has two first axes, okay? You have the wire in the middle that the pins are lined up to, so when we level the bubble, those pins have to be straight up and down, but we also have to set this bar, this vertical bar that everything slides up and down on, has to be parallel to those pins also. 
Mm -hmm. so, so you have, in, in, a, in a, like a five pin movable site, you have two first axes. On a single rack of pins, you basically have one, which is the rack of pins. So when we level that bubble, we're trying to make sure that that site runs perfectly plumb or that we're holding our pins straight up and down. It's, it's, it's no harder than that. Can, is this oversimplifying it? I've always thought of it as the pins being perfectly perpendicular to the riser, to the flat, to the, no, the, to the, the shelf. The, but the riser, and I was just about to cover that. Okay. The riser, the string, none of that has anything to do with site level. Okay. Okay. Because if that's because if that's off, then it yeah. doesn't. What people don't understand, and this is where people get confused, is with a with a rifle, your terminal velocity happens at thousand yards, right? Mm -hmm. That bullet's propelled, so you can actually propel the bullet across the horizon. Mm -hmm. With an arrow, that does not happen. The arrow has fletchings on it, so it hits terminal velocity three or four feet out of the bow, you know, or two or three yards out of the bow usually. Mm -hmm. That's where the fletching take over, and it just starts falling vertical at that point. Okay. So if you, if you set your first axis at a, a large cant to the riser, yes, you will get an error. It'll be about an arrow hole at two yards, but by three yards, it's corrected and falling in a vertical line at that point. Um, but that's irrelevant to anything. Um, so you wanna set, and we'll cover this in, in the leveling, but it, it just has no correlation to the riser or the string. If it was anything, it'd be the path of the arrow. But let's get back to the basics, okay? So the, we're setting the indicator, right? The indicator is the bubble. It's telling us the position of the first axis, okay? That's the importance of the first axis. The importance of third axis is nothing more than we are trying to set the bubble to where it does not lie to us, okay? That bubble has to run perpendicular to the plane of motion required for an up or downhill shot. So when you're, when you're aiming uphill or downhill, that bubble has to run perfectly perpendicular to that plane of motion. Otherwise, it runs out to the side. And the reason you get a left or right is because you're canting to get it back. Okay? So anything you do that influences the bow left or right, you know, if we got this bow here, and any, anything we do that influences the bow this way is going to affect the third axis. That's why torque affects third axis. That's why, that's why I cannot set your bow for third axis. The shooter has to do it. That's why this wire is on this Hamsky tool. Okay? Because the first axis has to be set at the full draw, and it has to be set with the torque load on the bow the way the shooter is, 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 is affecting it. And when we get in these extreme shots like this and we're, we're changing the torque load on the bow, we're in effect changing the third axis too. Mm -hmm. So that can be part of the error that we're, we're seeing, okay? So I took, you notice I took those out of order. I went first axis to third axis, right? Right. Well, second axis is simply just this connection of the bar well, actually, I, I did that wrong. Second axis, that's the bubble's relationship to the first axis. That's the second axis level, okay? That's this way, right? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's that's what I was talking about, second axis to the... Yeah, I did, axis, it wrong. I did it wrong, too. <laughs> I got a bubble up there. So third axis is the bubble's got to run perpendicular plane of motion. And first axis is this connection where you mount the bar to the, to the, the first axis, okay? Mm -hmm. Since the bubble is slave to the first axis, anything that happens behind this point really doesn't affect the leveling. It just affects the comfort, you know, where you naturally hold the bow level. So when I get done leveling and everything, and I'm, say for example, when I'm standing there with my eyes closed and I open my eyes and the bubble is sitting off to one side, you can either use your stabilizers to kind of counteract that, but if you still can't quite get it, then just loosen these two screws if your site has an adjustment and make a little pivot there until you get it to where it naturally holds level. That will change your, you know, your, your sighting a little bit, but you'll have to just move your indicator pin back or you might have to click a couple times on your windage, but then everything will be perfect. And the reason we can move it back here is because the bubble is slave to the first axis. Nothing you do back here is going to change that relationship, okay? Mm -hmm. It won't change the third axis, won't change anything, okay? So that's leveling in a nutshell. So when we use the Hamsky tool, um, at a target site here, but we can use this spot hog site. The Hamsky tool was designed to, to clip on a, a target site, okay? And whenever I, whenever I use, and, and there's lots of people out there propagating that you can click your, you know, you put your bow in a, in a device and you can level your first, second, and third axis. 
Well, you can level your second effectively, but you cannot level your third. Your third has to be done at full draw by the shooter. Okay. So when we clamp this level here on, on this first axis, it tells us, we can use this level to tell us, hey, the first axis is level, what's our indicator reading, okay? And on this, this spot hog, it's dead level right now. If it was off, then I would make adjustments here in, this, in the second axis, which are these two screws here, which pivot the site this way, okay? But the first thing you have to do when you have a, a rack of pins like this is you have to set the pins up against a wire. And usually I'll take a, in the back of my garage door, I have a level line that I've written with a Sharpie and I'll put that pins right up against that wire or on that line, that vertical line, or you can use a plumb bob if you're in the field or something, just hang a piece of rope or something. Just try to do it out of the wind or it'll drive you nuts. But, um, but that'll tell us, hey, when my pins are perfectly vertical, is the bubble reading right? And if it is, you're fine. Okay. One of the and Spot Hog does a good job of setting that wire in the middle of their site perfectly plumb to the wire because you only have one second axis adjustment here. Mm -hmm. um, this black gold site, for example, you have a single pin. So in this in this in this system, you really only have one first axis because you don't have a rack of pins, right? The only thing we have to do is set the level bubble here, which this 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 collar pivots to this vertical unit, okay? And because they were nice enough to not leave a very good spot for the hamski, you got really two options here. Um, and this this is the kind of things that you have to learn as a shooter uh, when they don't leave you these options because they don't leave a lot of room here to level third axis. Now, I'm good enough at it nowadays. I can I can pretty much. You can clamp, you, you, you just need a reference point, right? This, this wire, this, this, this uh, pin on this, this Hamsky tool is a reference point. So if I want to, say for example, I, didn't, I had a site that I couldn't really mount it on. As long as I found some place to mount it, say I wanted to mount it on the riser here, because it's just, we need something that's gonna show torque, right? This is kind of a fat riser, yeah. Kind of a fat. But there's a, depending on which tool you have, there's there's actually two holes. This one has two holes too. So we can, let me show this to you real quick. Because this is something that where people get really confused. And, and, and a lot of hunting sites, this is definitely the case. Because for some reason, these manufacturers just leave it up to you to level the site. You know, we sell a site, but you're going to have to figure out how to level it type attitude and that drives me crazy you know I, I was dealing with one manufacturer site and these guys all come from target archery and they still you, you go look at their hunting site and it's like how the hell do you level it you know how are you going to teach people how to level your site you sell them a 350 dollars hunting site and then you're not even teaching them how to level it you know and i've always said in this industry that there's a simple formula it's products it's people and it's education you have the best product in the field in your category, you have to surround it with the right people, and then you teach them and the customer how to use it and why it's better, and you can't lose. Right. But people get it wrong all the time. It, it just it's kind of crazy. But you can you can mount this uh, this pin. The new Hamsky tools have a have a vertical or they have two holes on it, so we can mount this anytime. If you can see here, we got this pin running vertical. Okay. Yeah. Now. You can either choose to adjust your first axis or you can just set this pin on a on a horizontal line. Like again, I draw a Sharpie line on the wall. And if you right. watch the Hamsky videos and then this podcast, you'll kind of start to get an idea. It, it can be really daunting to a lot of people and, and it can be confusing, but you, you need to learn this stuff and just delve into it and, and figure it out because it's really not that difficult once you get your head around it. So this pin here, if we put it on a vertical line, Is gonna if it's if it's if this pin is parallel to the surface like it would be on on some sites on a target site like when we put it on the spot hog, it was parallel to the first axis, right? Right. So we could just put this pin on a vertical line, and it, you know when we're we come to full draw, and I draw a sharpie line off the the bottom of the uh, the door or something, then I'll stand up and I'll point this downhill real steep at full draw. 
and I'll put those pin, that pin right on the vertical line. Well, that pin is telling me, hey, the site or the, the, the first axis is perfectly level. And if that bubble was not running pre perpendicular to that plane of motion, it would be running off to the side, okay? So that can tell us, you know, we put the pin on the line and then the bubble's off and we need to adjust our third axis either in or out to get it dead on, all right? So if, for example, you have a site that, like I have this mounted on the bar, let's just say it's, the pin is not parallel to the first axis, okay? Then, and the way you would tell that is you would, you'd, you'd put a, uh, because you have no way to clamp a level on here, what I would do is I would put a, I have a line that's straight out from me, okay? And then I have a line that's down off the floor, okay? So you have to figure out somehow to, you know, you can take the Hamsky tool and just set it here on the side of the first axis, and you can check the bubble against that, okay? And, if it's, and then adjust the ring. But really, on your second axis, you can do that, okay? Right. You gotta be real careful that you get it really good and flat. It'd just be nice if they left a flat spot on one side that you could actually clamp it. Because if you try to clamp it on the other side, it just tips and pivots and you can't get it right. Um, you can do your second with, the, with, with the, uh, the level on the other side. So we can simply set this, this, this level here that tells us, hey, this, this first axis is straight up and down. Okay, and then we can adjust that level in the site, right? Yeah. As long as it reads good, which it does, it's, it's fine. But to do the third, we have to have something to, uh, to gauge off of. And we, since we can't clamp it here, then I clamp it on the bar like I had it here before. And I draw it back and I put it on my vertical line, angled downwards. Now, let's just say, for example, I'm quarter bubble off, all right, when I lay it on the line. Um, as long as when I hold it on the line straight out in front of me, and, it, and that pins a quarter bubble off. Now, that being said, we've, we've set the level with the level on the bar, right, on this side. But if we hold it out in front of us on a vertical line, and it's, say, a quarter bubble to the left, as long as it stays a quarter bubble to the left when we go down, mm -hmm. then we know your bubble's running perpendicular to plane of motion. Now, I probably confused a whole lot of people right there. Um, a little bit. It, it, <laughs> there's more than one way to skin a cat, I guess. Now, I've noticed on these, these new uh, black gold sites, if I want to, if I can't put a, a Hamsky tool on it, sometimes I can just look off the side of the bow and I can see the first axis or I can see this surface right here. Mm -hmm. Well, that is your first axis. If I can lay that on a, on a vertical line, it's basically in a sense doing the same thing. I can set my third with that. So, so I know one of the ways a guy taught me how to do it freaking early 90s was to mm -hmm. take a skewer like one of those bamboo skewers mm -hmm. and tape it up against the scope. Basically what you're saying up against that. Well, here, let me grab it real quick. Um, oh shit. Never mind. I thought I had a sight in there, but I don't. Um, yeah, basically taping, taping it up against that. So you have that basically what your pins are you know, like that long, and then how you, how you, drew, you know, drew a line on the wall, yeah. put it at an angle, put it on a piece of plywood like this on an angle so you can get extreme right. angle. The problem is, is you have to make sure one of two things. You either have to take that wire and see, hey, my bubble's off a quarter bubble, mm -hmm. and I'm going to keep it the same all the way down, or you have to have a way to orient the first axis, you know, on, on a target site, see the first axis is automatically yeah. going to be running parallel to the surface, right? Yeah, yeah. Most target sites have a good flat spot to put them on. It'd be nice if, you know, bow hunting sites had a, a ledge to put them on. I mean, in target right. archery, this is, this is the way to level a site now. Um, you can shoot it in too, but that's fairly com complex and, you know, and you've got, uh, 
you know, shooter error. There's a lot of ways of doing it. This, this is the simplest, understanding the different sights. Now, one of the things I ran into when I shot spot hog, and I really liked a spot hog sight, but, you know, it's a little bit heavy. It's a lot bit heavy. Yeah. When I'd run out of arrows, I would take the sight off and throw it at animals to kill it. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's built like a tank, but it's just, it's just heavy. No, it's but they don't have a first axis adjustment here. And sometimes engineers just take the position, I don't need a first axis. I, I, I machine it perfectly. You shouldn't. Right. It's got to run parallel to the riser. You know, they kick this crazy position. Well, when you have a quiver on the side of your bow, full of arrows, mm -hmm. your bow naturally, most people naturally hold the bow with a little bit of a right hand anyway. And one of the worst things you can do is force your bow to level every time. If you're forcing your bow to level every time, you're basically like coiling a spring. Okay? Mm -hmm. As soon as you fire, it's going to uncoil, and usually it's going to uncoil at, at, vari at varying levels. And so you're going to string arrows left and right. So it's pretty important. You know, I shoot my bow this weekend, and my bubble was off. I ain't kidding you, an eighth of a bubble. And I was fighting it all weekend, and, and, and it was. It, it doesn't allow you to come in and naturally get into your shot and your aim because your mind is being distracted by that bubble. <laughs> All this stuff needs to be set up to, <laughs> to where it's uh, natural to you. Yep. Um, but on the spot hog site, when, when, because they don't have a first axis adjustment, again, this is a lot of, a lot of cheaper hunt, hunting sites, pin sites don't have a first axis adjustment. And again, we'll go back. The first axis adjustment are these two screws here where the, the bar mounts into the block, okay? So anything we pivot this way does not change any of your leveling because the bubble's slave to the first axis, okay? Now, on this site, it didn't have it. So what I would do is simply put a washer underneath between the, the site block and the bolt. And that would simply just, that would pivot the site slightly, which would allow me to put that cant in my bow. Um, just another, you know, another, another fix. You know, if you're, you run out of adjustment in your site, just put a washer underneath the bottom screw usually Usually it's the bottom screw because most people hold a little bit of a right cant in their bow. But every bow, every bow is a little different, how your hand naturally fits the grip and where those makes the, or makes everything align. So, you, you, you know, most, like I said, most three, five pin hunt sites don't have that adjustment. So if you're sitting up there and you always teach guys to draw with their eyes closed and open their eyes, if their bubble's not level, mm -hmm. then we need to either make adjustments to a stabilizer system, like, you know, whether you use a, oh, Counter slide, I don't know if I have one here. Or a two parts, oh, here's a counter slide on this bow, okay? This counter slide system is really nice, okay? This is a new system we had last year. We got it in the new micro hexes this year. Um, but we can pivot this inner, inner out from the bow and how much weight we have on it's gonna help offset the weight on the other side of the bow. Okay. Or you do a two part system like a Sport Hunter combo where you have a, a back bar and a front bar and you pivot the back bar in and out. That helps to a certain degree, but most bows have this overall overriding tendency that where they just you naturally settle into. I mean, you don't want to force that. You want to set the bow up to where you naturally hold up. And those little things like that um, make the difference. Absolutely. A lot, a lot of people that I always, you know, I get to shooting with people, and they're, ah, I don't shoot as good as you do. Well, you don't do what I do. Okay? Yeah. If you did the things that I do, and you learn the little techniques that I do, then it's simply nothing more than lining two objects up together, keeping your forces in alignment, and pulling the trigger. And probably oversimplifies it a little bit, but uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's shooting, really. Yeah. <laughs> if you teach fundamentals and you teach a good anchor point, you teach, you know, grip and anchor point, the two most important things to teach a new shooter. And gosh, you see guys that shoot for 20 years that suck in that department. And that's why they can't hit anything. That's me. Yeah, whatever. But I'm, I, I do suck in that department. I got terrible form, but it's repeatable terrible form. And that's why, and that's why it works for me because I no, consistently no do the same as, shitty stuff over and over again. Yeah, there's, no <laughs> such, there's no such thing as so-called perfect form. Okay, <laughs> there are people's ideas of perfect form. Right, right. Um, but if you look at real wild, you probably wouldn't say his form's perfect. I mean, I got I had some guys from Australia bashing my form, probably because I leaned back a little bit, but. You know, Randy Omer, as you said, you want to lean back a little bit and get, get your weight over your trunk and right. balance. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you do the same thing every time. Yeah. And there's certain exactly. things that, you know, there's certain things that make that easier. There's certain types of releases that are more accurate because 
you know, I always felt like, for example, a, a, a gated jaw, one that opens this way, you know, like a Scott single jaw caliper. What I shoot, I, I have a... That, I think that's one of the most accurate. Edge fold back. I'm, I'm shooting a true ball execute right now. Uh-huh. Awesome release. Double sear index. A little slow in the hunting department as far as loading up, you know. It's it's more desirable to have a hook because it loads faster, but I don't like hooks. I don't know, man. I just feel I like I'm not exactly. I, I can't I just, shoot there's a hook. Some, there's just something about it. I just don't feel like I'm as ac- quite as accurate with it. So, and I think I think it just has. I think that that loop kind of just drags the drags on that hook a little bit. I think so, so too. I think it, it not, causes you to pull one way or the is, other. I, I think it's a lot like a little mini finger release. Yeah. You know? Well, that's exactly what it is. I mean, yeah. It, you wonder it's one, how it's one can, finger. <laughs> you wonder how guys can hit anything with fingers, you know. Watch Brady Ellison shoot at 70 meters and never miss a ten ring like that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's like me. I'm awesome with the yeah. fingers. <laughs> I I so you're freaking good, you're good, huh? Yeah, I, that's what it is. When I when I, there's days where I am just lights out. But and then there's days that I just suck so bad I can't. When I shoot my recurve, I'm like, there's, I'm either awesome or I suck. There's like no in between, well, and I can never figure out what the hell I'm doing. Well, the thing about a recurve is, I, I dabble in that too. I mean, I like to shoot trad, and I've, I've shot pretty well with it in the past. But traditional archery brings out, especially if you're shooting somewhat instinctive, it brings out focus. If you're uh-huh. not focused, if your mind wanders. You are going to get what your mind asks for. Oh yeah. Um, whereas when you're shooting pins or you have a scope, you you might your mind might be wandering, but you have pin on a target that's holding you there. You don't have that with uh, with a trad bow. You know, exactly. it's all about focus and being able to bore a hole into what you're you're aiming at, and that can be, you know, that's why most you know a lot of guys are gap shooters. Really, they're not. Yeah. You know, they're not pure instinctive shooters because that takes a level of of concentration that a lot of people don't have. I switched the gap, sort of yeah. gap shooting. Well, I was, I was talking to Aaron Snyder, you know, he's shooting for us now and and he's shoot out tagging everything with a recurve now. But but again, he's like, I build my arrow for a 40 yard point impact. So he may load the point up, but it isn't because he likes heavy points. It's because that's where it hits point on at 40 yards. Then he can adjust from there. Yeah. In, you know, he's probably got 10 yards out, 10 and 20 yards back that he can adjust with. So, you know, but, you know, we I, don't did, even want I did the back. same thing. And I, but I did it with, um, I adjusted mine with the length of the arrow. I found out once I started shooting a full length arrow, instead of cutting it to my draw length, that now at full draw, if I point, point on, I'm at, I'm 20 yards at point on. And right. it's very easy for me to adjust that way. Like, I don't, at least out to 45, 50 yards, but. You sim- yeah, you've simply just closed the gap to your eye. You, the yeah. gap from the point to the target is a lot less, so it's easier for your mind to, to know where you're at, you know, yeah. per se. So, yeah, there's all kinds of tricks like that, but I figure if you're gonna aim with the freaking point of the air, you might as well put a flipping side on it. Yeah, true, true. You, true. You're gonna be more accurate. Yeah. The only thing not letting you is, well, we don't even go there. <laughs> <laughs> is everybody that's going to make fun of you, you use a sight. That's not trad hunting. Yeah, well, None of this easy. shit's trad hunting, man. You want to trad hunt? Go chop down a tree. Scrape that shit. Make it your make your own self bow. That's what go I want to do. steal some horse hairs off of your freaking neighbor's horse and build yourself a string and then tell me you that's, shoot trad. That's what I swear it's always been one of my childhood dreams to shoot a shoot a buffalo off the back of a horse. Oh, that'd be with cool. With a bow, with, with a bow I built myself, with a broadhead that I chipped myself. Yep. But well, the problem with that is you can freaking nobody lets you use uh, flint. So I I had set myself a goal to do that. I was going to shoot a javelina because I figured I could get close enough to a javelina, or that, or I was going to do a whitetail in New York where I knew I could control the environment. I knew it'd be like a 15 yard or less shot, whatever. Um, but yeah, I couldn't use, you couldn't use, uh, I, I, I got, I made bamboo shafts, napped my own arrowheads, you know, the whole nines, you know, turkey feathers, the whole, everything built my own bow. I, I, I've been building bows for a long time just cause I, I'm infatuated with it. Not, 
not because uh, I, I want to do anything with it, but um, yeah, and I just I never end up doing it because I found out it would be illegal for me to shoot one with it, and so. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've, I've been bow hunting for my 35 years, and I mean, bow hunting's bow hunting. You can get out of it what you want to put into it. If you're going to shoot trad equipment, it's probably going to mean you're not going to get as many opportunities. It's probably, you know, and some people enjoy the just the the being out in the elements, but it's going to limit your opportunities. Oh yeah. Unless you just got an inordinate amount of time to spend out there, like better does. He just lives in the mountain. <laughs> So you're going to get opportunities the more time you spend out there. Myself, probably like a lot of guys, I don't get that much time to go hunting because I'm gone 100 days the rest of the year, you know. And so I just, you know, I get out of it what I can. I, I still enjoy it. There's nothing better than spot and stalking mealies or coos deer or yeah. a rut and bull elk, you know. I mean, I love antelope hunting. I mean, oh, it's just, best. it's fun irregardless of how you do it, you know. It's it's just the thrill of the chase, and, and it's all hard with a bow. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how good you are. Yep. It's hard. Animals, once you get inside that 120-yard range, they just they have a uncanny knowledge that you're there. And uh, it just becomes a lot more difficult. You know, it's not the same as, you know, like I said before, 300 to the new 800-yard average you know, yep. rifles. You know, guys talk. Sure, about I can shoot fifteen hundred yards with my rifle. <laughs> that's crazy. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I, that's. I've got five rifles sitting at home, never fired a bullet out of. You know. It's really. Like, I, I was like that for a long time. I just literally started enjoying rifle hunting again just recently. My my cousin Anthony started uh, Phoenix Shooting Bags, and uh, he's been doing it for I don't know about ten years now. But he just brought him to market in the, in the last couple. Of, years here um and when he taught me how to shoot off of these little bags yeah i went from shooting six seven hundred yards which i thought was you know freaking excellent shot to i could literally same gun i could shoot 1500 yards without not even thinking about it and what are you doing well so instead of you know like when you're when you're resting okay on even on a pack or whatever you're still having to muscle the gun into you know, the crosshairs where you want them to be. Well, with, with the shooting bags, the fr you know, you put the first, uh, the front of the butt of the gun on, on the front shooting bag, and the back has a shooting bag. And all you're doing is using your hand strength to squeeze the bag or relax the bag to drop and lift the elevation of the gun. And it's yes. just like, yeah, I mean, I night and, and so the only input into the gun is this. Like, you just rest in your cheek and you're just using this and you're not holding the gun. You're not, like, it's just, it's yeah. stupid. I use a, I, I, I've been getting into shooting pellet, high dollar pellet rifles. I'm coming, nice. actually coming down to Arizona for a shoot in October. I paid my first entry fee. I'm probably going to get my butt whapped. But, <laughs> uh, it's tricky, man. I mean, I'm just learning the mechanics and I have an uncanny ability to buy crappy freaking stuff and have to learn every aspect. <laughs> That was me too. I did that for. I, I use a fire. Can you ever ever use that fire control station? No. That Caldwell makes. No, I have not. I've heard of it. They have a fire control station. Then you just have a little arm that you move the gutter the gun around. So you just get yeah. it close, and then you get a little arm. You just kind of brace yourself, and you just move it around. That that basically does the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I I'll get you a couple of these. I'll let you play with them. I mean, honestly, I, and I'll send you a link to the video. It's it's nuts how what a difference it makes. And it's, I'll do that in my spare time. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're going to start shooting, you could use them with the pellet gun too. I was teaching I my just, kids. I just shoot them. my pellet gun in my backyard. My neighbors don't know what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's freaking loud. I couldn't even shoot. I couldn't, I mean, I don't have much of a backyard anyway. It's only freaking 20 yards across, but. It, it's amazing where they've come with these, these pellet guns. I mean, they're hundred yard accurate, you know, and they're, they, you can't even hear them go off hardly. I was with a guy that had a compressed air one, you know, that you you fill up the the bottle like if you were shooting a pay, uh, paintball gun, yeah. and um, it was a twenty two caliber one, and he was shooting coyotes at one hundred fifty yards with it. Oh yeah, it's probably an FX or something like that. I don't know which kind it was, but it was freaking nuts. I was like, I need one of those. He's like, yeah, it's sixteen hundred bucks. I'm like, no, I don't need one of those. Yeah, yeah mine. Was <laughs> one I got like two grand. It's like, Fuck that. They're, made, they're they're pretty awesome. 
Yeah, of course I, I'm having problems, so I gotta figure out how to fix it. Yeah. Like every, like everything else, that's how I learned everything in archery the hard way, right? Yep. Yep. You know, it's, and I, I enjoy that side of it. It's just a little frustrating sometimes, you know, when you, you know you're dealing with manufacturers that come out with, you know, whether it be a rangefinder or a bow or a sight, and if, if there's got to be some 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 value in the marketplace for for consult somebody like myself to come in and look at this product before they actually put it on the market and say, hey, there is. I used to do that actually. You know, there's got to be a better way to to build products to make them more user friendly and to, you know to, to to solve that education part of that you know scenario I talked about. So that's how I broke into the uh, into the industry. I actually used to do product testing. And yeah. Give run items through the ringer and then I still do it now. I mean, guys, companies send me stuff all the time to review. Yeah, but can't now, it's more so, now it's can't more so. Now it's more so. I think. You know, I, I look at yeah. one product in example. You know, I was invited to Rage Broadhead shoot at the trade show a few years back, and you know, that was back when they had the rubber rings on the broadhead. Oh uh, yeah. It took me about a day to figure out that that was a problem. You know, and all yeah. I did is to solve it was file a deeper notch in the in the blade, mm -hmm. and yeah, that was a that was a short fix. The system they have now is quite a bit better, but uh, um, but just stuff like that. They they. They lost a lot of market share and steam to just, you know, broadheads coming open to people's quivers or, yep. you know, that's why I stopped coming. shooting them. And, and it's crazy. They should that should never have happened. Yeah. Oh, like the, the broadheads lethal. Everything I ever shot with a died in sight. You know. And oh yeah, it's a freaking great broadhead. I mean, that and one of the, my big pet peeves with with broadheads, including mechanicals, is is. Everybody always claims their broadhead flies like a field point, which is total BS. Yep. And you might be able to make your broadhead fly like the field point, but the broadhead does not fly like the field point. Even mechanicals. Most mechanicals are, you know, this long. So number one, not only do they not fly like the field point, mm -hmm. they don't tune like the field point. Right. So if they don't tune like the field point, there's no way in hell they're going to fly like the field point. And okay. most of them That's don't even have the same. mine is in the front. <laughs> Most of them don't even have the same drag effect as a field point. And I use bare match points a lot because that's all available, you know, but they have a better BC than most broadheads. So you can't calculate the same drag effect. But these G5 was the first one to come out with a broadhead last year that had a practice point that so called been, you know, I don't know, wind tunnel tested. Mm -hmm. I prefer it to be hammer tested myself there you go <laughs> i trust trust and verify <laughs> there you go <laughs> just because they say one thing doesn't necessarily mean it's true you know so you, you really that's one of the big things about bow hunting especially bow hunting at longer distances is you have to shoot the broadhead okay or you have to find a practice point system mm -hmm. that you have checked against the broadhead to make sure that you have a way to reliably practice with your hunting setup. Otherwise, right. you're it's a crapshoot, okay? And you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get what you expect, you know, just because you can go out at 100 yards and you can shoot a group like that with a field point. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you can do it with a broadhead. Right. Any I don't care, you know, the schwackers you shoot, I guess are they're pretty aerodynamic. I'm just yeah. going to plead. I'm, I'm not even going to comment there, but I know you're not a big fan, but I, I, I've honestly have nothing but good luck with them, or you know, nothing I, I, but good I, experience I, with them. I don't say want to say luck, but they kill a lot of deer. Every you know, I tell everybody and Levi loves them. them. <laughs> sure Maybe he, he gets paid to love them. I don't know, but <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I'm sure he does, but uh, I that's two things I never sign contracts on. Releases and broadheads. Yeah. Somebody's always got something new I want to try, you know. And, right, right. And I always liked the NAP kill zone, and the reason I liked it so much, and then initially I bought it because it had a practice blade that looked really close to the broadhead. And just like every other experience I had, it at 120 yards, I think it lost it, the practice point was a couple yards higher than the broadhead. Then they come out with that practice blade insert. Well, the practice blade insert was money. I mean, 
even at 120, it would hit exactly the same. So there became a reliable situation where I could practice with that head, but, you know, and it was okay. I mean, it was like the blades were cheap steel and you'd bend the ears on them and break them and, you know, mm -hmm. that's fine if they're readily available, but they never seem to make practice systems readily available, you know. Uh, and it's probably because the market doesn't call for, like, you and I are – different breed man i mean yeah, but most market, guys aren't going to go out there and spend 36 bucks or 26 bucks for a pack of three practice heads and you know buy like five or six like they would it, it, it just doesn't happen i disagree yeah you think so I, uh, I, mean, I i think the entire industry is being sold short by i think a lot of it's just a, an educated dealer base i mean or the dealers tend to you know take the happy medium instead of taking the approach of, hey, I want to teach my customer base a better way. Now, if, you know, I see guys post all the time, wow, I like a one-pin sight. Well, I like a one-pin sight too. It's more accurate. But in a hunting scenario, it's not practical. When I shot my doll sheep, I'd actually, this is kind of a funny story. Um, so I get up, I watch this ram go up over the top. And so I grabbed three days worth of gear and went up after him and, and, uh, I ended up getting on this this ram the very first day and i had a one pin target sight on because of course it was more accurate right mm -hmm. and uh i had the first bushnell rangefinder the big one you know oh, big, God. big laser the one that, I, I, the one that something went like this something, yeah there was something wrong with it in, in retrospect looking back i just knew if i added 10 percent, i was i was on i was on meters well, <laughs> so I snuck up on this sheep. It's like the most perfect stock ever, you know, 48 yards, bedded, looking out over his vista, you know, and I set the sight, put it on 52 yards, draw back, and blew a chunk of hair off top of his back. Mm. I was sick. Well, he jumps up and he moves. Oh, and I figured 10 yards, so I just, I only have one pin now. Mm-hmm. I have no gauge of how far, 10 yards, five yards. And with pins, I, I, after that, I never ran a single pin mover ever again for that reason. Well, my second ear, I just held too high and I clipped his ear. I, I shot that same ram three weeks later. And on the other side of the mountain, he had a chunk of hair missing off the top of his back. His ear was clipped. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> but, you know, and, and then, then, I, then I went to three pin movers. So I figured I put the pin in the middle that I, that I use on the slider. And then I'd have a 30, 40, 50. And if I had a 20, I just hold low. Mm -hmm. If I white tail hunt, I, I add a 20 yard pin. And then I had a couple situations where in the rut, a mule deer come by me too fast, couldn't move the site, you know, didn't have time, mm -hmm. you know. And so I kept adding pins and now I'm up to a 30 to 80 with a mover. And it's all based on practicalities and hunting situations. Now, do I feel if, if between 60 and 80, if I got a chance to move the site and aim right where I want to hit, I'm going to do that because pins become less accurate. It's just a less accurate way when you're gapping pins to shoot. And, you know, I'm as good a pin shooter as anybody in the world. And I, and I just know what happens. If I put my wife, for example, and I'll put my wife on a three pin mover still, because then she's got, one pin in the middle, one on the top of the back, or it depends how I have her, but I, I make it simple for her. I don't want her to have too much data here. Think, don't shoot yeah. her, right? So, but I want her to have that option. But when I have her shoot the split pins, oh, it's painful. It's painful to watch, but have her move the sight, put it right where she wants to hit. I think that's the best way to start somebody out because it slows them down. Hmm. Okay. It really slows them down. So, but would I personally, at my level, put a single pin mover on? No way, no how. I can't. Gonna... I, I have guys, friends over here that do it, and I don't know. I had a friend of mine that does that, the pop-up 3D with a single pin, and I'm like, dude, how do you, I mean, how do you do that? Yeah. Like, it just, I mean, you got to know, you got to know on your pin, I guess, like where or where to hold, but like. That's that's not conducive to winning. Um, I don't think, I don't think it is. Yeah, I don't. For me, I I shoot I shoot a seven pin sight, you know it's twenty yeah, to, twenty to eighty yards, it, you know I can if I want to take a longer shot I know how to I know how to uh, you know pin gap to shoot ninety or whatever. So, but yeah, 
I don't like to have to think that, oh, shit, did I, did I set the site? Did I leave it on 60 or did I, did I move it from the last, you know, when I had the last shot? Because I've, you know. Yeah, if you're going to get into, like, extreme accuracy and stuff, and I'm playing with this now. I mean, I use Arch's Advantage to, to print my site tapes, right? Yeah. And most guys walk into a dealer and let a dealer print it based off of the chronograph reading. It ain't even going to be right. No, you, you know, for for $12, for $12 a year, you can get archersadvantageonline.com, right? You can uh -huh. go get the service, learn how to use it. But one thing I've had to learn how to do is to tweak the trajectory in it because sometimes, and I really to this day do not know why, but sometimes I'll get my 20 and my 100 perfect and the 50 will be off a yard. Huh. Well, when I went to Reading, I was hitting a yard, what was I hitting, a yard low. So I adjust, is just go in and adjust the peep height until it prints the middle mark correctly, okay? I just did it this weekend, and it's exactly the opposite. So it's right back to, I, I don't really know why, but I always check that. And, and also, whenever I go on hunts, I always take sight tapes with me. Because what people really don't understand, especially if you're coming out west or you're going to Alaska Elevation. or you're going somewhere, like I live at 4,500 feet and I go to Kodiak Island. The air density on the beach at Kodiak Island is way thicker. Mm -hmm. And you're going to find that you're going to have to run a sight tape that was probably four, five, even six foot a second slower. Um, and if you don't have a target and you don't have, you know, the wherewithal to change I mean, you're just going to miss, and you're going to wonder all week why you're missing. And but I don't think a lot of people take that stuff into consideration. No, no. I I, I do to an extent. I I think about it, especially when I'm. I know I'm hunting really really high, um, elevation. I mean, because I'm at 1500 over here, so. You know, no any anything lower than this is not really that much of a difference. But when I go to really high, like start around 10,000 feet that's when I really notice a big enough difference that I need to make a change well, you, um, should just, you should always take a target with you and just yeah it's so easy just to print out some graduated side tapes okay yep. go in and print side tapes off it's going to give the option to change the speed and you know I just take 10 foot a second either side with me and usually I know if I'm going someplace like I know if if I'm going someplace higher I'm going to need faster tapes and I know if I'm going someplace where it's lower or, or the air density is higher or the humidity level is higher. Um, and it really, 20 to, 20 to 50, 20 to 60, you're not going to make that much of a difference. You know? no. But when you start getting to the longer yardages, that's where you're really going to notice this stuff. So even from here to Redding, California every year, it's usually a couple foot a second. Yeah. And some of that has to do with the, the diameter of the arrow you're shooting too. If you're shooting small diameter arrows like the gold tip pierce, it's not going to affect it as much as if, say, you're shooting a, you know, an XT hunter or something like right. that. Cool. I think we've um, like confused the shit out of everybody. <laughs> but <laughs> that, you know what? I, you're definitely going to have to go and watch when we were talking about the site level. You're going to have to go watch this episode if you're listening to it. Uh, go watch that part on my YouTube channel when I post, I'll post it simultaneously. So it'll be on YouTube. You can go look at that spot. So you can actually see what, what Tim is doing. Um, yeah, I can go to Hamsky, go to Hamsky. Oh yeah. Archie. Hamsky's got really, you guys got a good bunch of good, like five there's or six real, videos that are. There's some, it can, it, and, and even that, I, you know, if you'll watch that and then listen to this podcast where we kind of explained it a little more simpler, um, you, you'll get a better idea. You know, the more you learn about it, the better off you are. You know, you can't, ignorance is not bliss in this subject. You know, you just gotta, you gotta learn it. Yeah. You're gonna have a level, if you don't know how to do it, you're better off getting rid of the level bubble altogether. You know what, for a long time, I never looked at my level bubble. I mean, it was I there, see. but I just looked past it. Cause I, yeah. Yeah. it's just the way I, I hold. Top, <laughs> yeah. I, see top pro, I see top pro guys do that in 3D archery. But as soon as we get into some, some courses that, where they got side hills and stuff, they yeah. pay for it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You, gotta learn, you learn, once you learn about it, you learn to trust that bubble with your life because it's going gonna, it's gonna to matter. Yeah. And how you set up on the shot. If, here's another thing we never really covered. 
this is something that I got taught early on shooting field archery. If you're shooting side hills, right? Say you're walking on steep side hills, which is typical a lot in hunting. You always want to draw with your bow limb into the hill, okay? And let your level bubble float out this way. Because if you draw like this and then bring it up into the hill, you're basically, again, like coiling a spring, mm -hmm. and you're always going to hit to the downhill side. Right. And it can be quite dramatic. Um, in fact, you know, you do some experimenting with it, you might even be better aiming a couple inches into the uphill side because gravity almost always seems to want you to to fall and, and, to, and to follow through down the hill. So, um, again, all these things are just techniques, um, you know, on, on learning how to shoot better. Nothing can teach you to shoot better than getting out and shoot field straight. archery and shoot competitive archery. Um, your competitive archers, and I've argued this, you know, with my bosses and stuff, and I run a big shooting staff here at Gold Tip. Um, I look for key and influential guys, guys that are active and, and influential that actually have the knowledge and have the, uh, you know, the credibility in their local area where, you know, they're the guys, the go-to guy, you know, because they're involved, they're learning this stuff. They, they're, they're involved in archery and some of the best bow hunters I know are top level tournament guys. Number one, they don't miss. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> Very often. And, you know, that same attitude that it takes to be a good target archer, you know, goes directly into becoming a good hunter. It's just you're a competitive person. You're going to do what it takes to, you know, to be good at the good at everything. Right. Well, cool. Well, thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Um, you know, you're always a wealth of knowledge. I uh, wh where can uh, listeners find out more about you? And uh, you mentioned some of the videos on Hamsky Archery. So that's HamskyArchery.com, right? Yeah, hamskyarchery.com. They can follow me on Facebook. Uh, you know, I, I'm not the world's best at keeping up with that. I have an athlete page, and I, you can ask me questions on there. Sometimes it takes me a couple of days because I forget that they come up different places. But, uh, you know, message me on Messenger. I work cool. full-time at Gold, Gold Tips, so you can call me here even. You know, I'm in the office. Uh, this time of year, I'm in the office, you know, usually early part of the week. I'm traveling to a lot of tournaments, and I'll be at – you know, most of the major tournaments I'll be at with a booth for gold tips. So don't don't hesitate to come up and talk to me if you're around and check out the new products and you know, I'll help you when I can. You know, there's there's some good videos too that we do on Gold Tips site in relationship mm -hmm. to arrows and um you know, there's some really good, you know, subjects on building better arrows, on like building our Pierce hunting arrow. There's uh Broadhead alignment for the bow hunters. Uh, there's a really good video on broadhead alignment. If you're using small diamond arrows like the Pierce, um, you know, look at that building the Pierce hunting arrow video. It's it's really informative on how to mm -hmm. how to spin tune your inserts in and and get your broadhead spinning perfectly straight because that's one of the, the most important things when you're dealing with uh, uh, you know broadhead accuracy is making sure that they're they're perfectly you know spun straight. So right. Which is something I never do. Maybe I'll, in my spare time, if I get some spare, <laughs> get some spare time here, I've got. Uh, I don't know. Eventually, I'd like to, to build a you know a website full of you know technical training videos that, that can help people out because it, there's a lot of need for it in the in the in the business and uh, there's just you know this whole industry is structured to where it's funny to me that the people don't value advice. They'll pay a thousand dollars for a bow. Mm -hmm. but they will pay nothing to learn how to shoot it. Yeah. And, you know, it's not that hard. If you teach guys basic fundamentals, you can get them out, you know, really accurate, you know, out of distance in, in pretty short order. So, um, and, 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 you know, if, if I was a full-time professional archer, then I would have more time to, to teach seminars, to, to do this, to do that. So, you know, I enjoy what I do here at Gold Tips. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's a lot of fun and, and it's been, been a very rewarding job here and and i it, it, it puts me in contact with a lot of people in archery and you know hopefully i've uh, been able to uh, you know affect a lot of those in a positive way so oh i'm sure so. some some would say in a negative way but uh, you know. <laughs> well, awesome man well uh we look forward to seeing that site hopefully you'll get it together yeah well not my expertise by any stretch <laughs> 
All right, man. Well, have a good uh, rest of your uh, archery season. And, uh, All right. Well, we're headed to we'll London to come tomorrow for the next leg of the ASA. So sounds like we're going to be rained, rain every day. So well, that's that London. <laughs> well, London, Kentucky, not London, England. Oh, really? Okay. I don't know. Yeah. London, Kentucky. I've been there a bunch of times, but I didn't know there was a London, Kentucky. Cool. <laughs> All right, well, brother, give me a call if you uh, if you need some help on that six A hunt. Yeah, I've got. Well, uh, I know, I know, you got quite a bit of few people over here that got got that cover for you, but you yeah, got your wife and your husband or your dad too, right? I got a stack of Primos trail cameras over there just waiting to be shipped to Arizona. So there you go. <laughs> to my people. Nice. To your peeps. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I just want to take my mom and dad on a, or my dad and my wife on a on a good elk hunt. You know, my dad's getting older, so. It'll be a good uh, one. You'll see a lot of elk. Never really got to experience the old rut hunt. There's nothing like the rut hunt in Arizona. Nope. They do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, if they do what they're supposed to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy how much better it is than everywhere else. <laughs> there really is. It's 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 pretty sad. All right. Well, I'll let you go. All Take right, it easy. Sounds well. good, John. We'll see you.